Jameson? Jameson? Jameson. Jameson. Yeah. Okay. We'll get that straight. Jameson Duncan. All right, everyone, welcome to the next talk in our series here in track three. Just a couple of reminders before we get started with the talk. Uh, it is hope policy, and we would like you to make sure that you, if, you, if you can, follow it as much as possible to keep your mask on indoors. If you want to take your mask off, just step outside, take it off. You know, we're trying to be consistent with our, our code of conduct that we set for ourselves, and so we want to keep everyone healthy and happy and enjoy the rest of the conference. Following on that, be sure you stay hydrated. I know it's hot outside. We don't want anybody to pass out or miss part of the conference because you didn't get enough to drink, so please make sure you stay hydrated. When you're in the, in the talk today, please mute your phone. The audio equipment is super sensitive, so it picks up most everything that happens. Uh, we have a set of unscheduled tracks, or an, an unscheduled track, a fourth unscheduled track, where if you haven't proposed a, a talk or a session, you can propose one today and go sign up for it. Go to the info desk, and they'll help you get signed up. You need to provide your own materials, not a video, but it is a chance for you to present and talk if you would like to. Hacker Karaoke is tonight at 10 p.m. in track one, which is fourth floor, DAC 416. That was where the keynote was, or the opening. Uh, sing it straight, modify the lyrics to Hacker Theme, bring your best performance, it will be judged. I, I won't be there, but I'm sure some of you hopefully will do well at it. Volunteers are welcome. We, need, we still need volunteers for the rest of the conference, so if you are interested, please stop by and stop by room 301 or stop by the info desk. Uh, if you volunteer, there's a good chance you can get a green shirt at the end of the day. And lastly, the first block of late night mature content programming is in the video room, 406, fourth floor, and it'll begin tonight after 9.30. Tonight's video room late night theme is humor and horror, so expect the unexpected. With that, this talk is creating a general purpose network through wireless mesh, and this is Jameson Dungan, and with that, we'll pass it over to you, Jameson. Thank you. Hey, we're all back at Hope after four years. This is great. I, I love Hope. It's one of my favorite conferences. New, new venue and everything, too. This is, this is cool. You guys watching a lot of cool talks so far? Yeah? Yeah, I'm having so much fun, too. All right. So um, I live in uh, Norfolk, Virginia, and I created a uh, mesh net there. Well, I'm currently working on creating the network there. And um, I'll give you a little bit of uh, background of what's going on with it and why I decided to, to take this on. Um, I actually got the idea from Hope like eight, ten years ago, something like that, when I saw the NYC mesh net. But um, I wanted to create a general purpose network that was not connected to the internet, that anybody in the city could use or host stuff on or, or contribute to or wh whatever they wanted to do with it. And um, that was part of it, and I wanted it to make it kind of like the, the early 90s internet, where it was a lot of fun, a lot of zany art, a lot of, lot of abstract kind of pointless stuff for, for fun art's sake. But the other part was um, kind of like an emergency communications network in case like there's some kind of grid down thing. And I figured uh, connecting people was really important, and if people had the ability to communicate, share data, look at stuff, maybe there wouldn't be as much of a panic if something broke out, like something crazy happened, like a hurricane comes through or something. So that was my, uh, my motivation behind a lot of this stuff. So let's go through and uh, look at it. So what is a mesh net? A lot of people might know some of these things, so we can review a little bit, but it's a um, decentralized network where all the nodes connect to as many other nodes as possible. And it's usually uh, self-organizing, self-healing. There is no like central authority. So it's really easy to uh, make it fault tolerant and, and have a uh, lack of centralization. So uh, a lot of people are probably familiar with the OSI model. I'm not going to go too deep into this, but the first three layers are the, the physical, the data, and the network. That's um, like hardware, physical stuff, like electrical impulses on copper lines, stuff like that. Um, MAC addresses is the, the that, and then um, TCP, or IP addresses and routing and stuff like that is layer three. So I'm going to stick to just those three, and that's what I've been working on with the mesh net itself. And uh, yeah. This is the hardware I've been using. Um, Ubiquity, they make some really good stuff. It's pretty affordable. I've been using the uh, M5 nano station. It's, uh, it's crazy range. It's a directional antenna. It gets about 120 degree um, sector kind of thing. So three of them makes a circle, 120, 240, 360. 
And then the other is uh, access points. So I'll get the directional antennas to connect buildings to buildings, and then the access points are your general Wi-Fi access points that a lot of devices would connect to. Um, you can get this stuff used for pretty cheap on eBay. Like these things are like 15, 10 bucks a piece or something like that if you buy them in bulk. Uh, they're a little bit older, so a lot of places have phased stuff out, but these things can do 300 megabits a second. So it's not super fast, but that's pretty fast for me. You know, that's all I need. <laughs> And um, here's some pictures of what they look like. They're only about this big. I wanted to bring one, but I didn't have enough room. And um, same with the access points. A lot of people phase these things out, so you can uh, do this. And what's great with Ubiquity is all the, the software for managing this stuff is licensed free, so you can, you can host and manage, like, it's made to design to make your own, like, wireless internet service provider or whatever you want, so a lot of things are built in like that. Um, so first thing, you want to get a, a, a good kit to, um, uh, crimp your, your cables. You don't want to go cheap on Ethernet cable. You want to get real good, solid outdoor that shielded cable. That's one thing you don't want to go cheap on. You can go cheap on the, the used stuff, but not this. You want to remember your uh, color, color coordination, however you, you remember that. And then um, get a cable tester so you can plug these in on different ends and it will run through all eight lines. You can see which ones are there or not. And this, this is helpful if like one's on the roof and the other's down the side, you know, so you got to go back and forth. But um, here you go, so once you get that up, you can start uh, programming them, get in there and um, name them, configuring them, stuff like that. And then um, antenna bases, also buy these in bulk. This is uh, real good. And then you see here, this is uh, three of them that I have. And uh, I started experimenting with uh, antenna bases. And uh, these are um, eight by tens. You wanna go real big so the wind don't knock these things over. And then I just got a piece of PVC. I think it was like an inch and a quarter, inch and a half, I can't remember. And that extended it to be about uh, six feet tall. So that, after some iterations of trying, that's what I've come up with. And that's lasted a few years on a lot of roofs through a lot of storms and stuff like that. Haven't had any issues now. But um, I've made it so where, you can see on the uh, far right picture, I've got it so it can flat pack it. So I got it to where um, you just bolt them together and you can drive around like that in your car, and then it's easy to take these things up a ladder onto the roof or something like that because these things are, are really big, so trying to get them up there was, was hard, and I learned a different way to converge to something more like this. And uh, this is what my car looked like. It looked like that for a couple years, so I'm always like kind of running this stuff around. But So say so you want to get a good spool of Ethernet cable. That's the, that's the, the money that you're spending right there. You want to go uh, solid copper, not copper clad, stuff like that. Um, here you can see um, one of the old antenna bases right here, how it only comes up to like right there. And you see how skinny they are and stuff like that compared to the longer, newer ones. So uh, those are two of the antennas that we have up right now, just as an example for what they look like. Um, here's kind of like a outside office. This is what I would do to, to work on these things. Once I get them up there, I'd get a power supply because these things are all run over uh, power over ethernet and get a little computer up there so you can actually test and see if you're getting signals and stuff like that and actually connecting to these networks. Then I did some war walking once I got some uh, of these towers up. So I uh, just got a battery pack and a backpack and just walked around with these things and I could do a lot of signal testing, go around the city and see where, you know, where, where good coverage is and stuff like that and just get a basic idea of what's going on. Got up on rooftops like that. And it, it was a lot of fun once these things actually started connecting. So that's, um, our downtown from where I just was in that same picture, just kind of like looking off to the left. And I have an antenna from our makerspace to this place and then from this place out to the downtown. And um, we went up on top of a parking garage down there and actually connected. And this was like awesome feeling because it actually worked and you could actually get a signal. And you can see some of the, the specs there of 300 megabits. And it was just like a, a scene out of a movie or something. It made me feel really good, you know, almost like this. <laughs> Like that's because it connected and you're on the roof and stuff. And I'm like, yeah, this is, this is working. So um, here's where one of the, the nodes are. This is our uh, makerspace, 757 makerspace. If you're ever in Norfolk, come visit. I'd love to show you around. It's like the size of a block. It, it, it's awesome. It's my favorite place. We have all kinds of stuff like this on the inside. The other place down the street where you, you just saw me on the roof is this. This was built in like the late 1800s and the first floor is occupied but everything else is abandoned and my friend runs a, a tech company out of there and it was really cool and right at the very top, uh, right up in here is where the antenna is and that's one of the highest parts in the city in that area so you get amazing coverage from there. 
And uh, on the inside, it looks like this. Oh, it's not auto plane. Maybe it won't. Uh, well, whatever. Uh, it, it's my friend spot, and he's got some really cool drone stuff in there. It's all this this neat stuff. But just wanted to show what it looked like. The third place is um, Slow Dive Gallery. It's like this really neat. I don't think it's gonna play, is it? Yeah, no. Um, it's like a venue art spot. So those are the three places that we have antennas up right now that connect all of them together. I don't want to expand it any more than this right now until we actually get more functioning stuff, but I think this would be really cool because there's three different places that have very artsy, neat feels to it. And I want to make some kind of collaborative art thing to go on where you can interact at all three places at the same time and do some neat things. Like one of the ideas was making something like a, a holographic phone booth that we we're going to call a hollow booth and you could get in there and talk to people at other places and stuff through a, like a high bandwidth network that's not on the internet, just through the city. I think that'd be pretty cool is like to show other people, get them interested in, in using this network. So once you connect to yourself, what do you do? <laughs> so you gotta get some routing going on. So I got these things. Um, these were about $20, $25, something like that. I don't know what they are now with the chip shortage and everything. But uh, the reason I picked this is because they're, um, they're called the Nano Pi RS2. They use uh, dual gigabit. Both ports are gigabit. They're powered over uh, USB, and they that's just a little information from the page right there. Powered off of a, a SD card, so you can get everything you want on there and get all your different routing protocols on there. Um, this is layer three, like I was just mentioning. I'm still learning the routing stuff. I've, I've been teaching myself this as, as I go along. And uh, you just wanna, you wanna experiment. You don't wanna worry about failing. You actually wanna fail a lot and see how it works and it drives you forward. So um, I wanna get OSPF on there because that's a already standard, that's open shortest path first. It's a routing protocol. And you can, um, that's, that's already an established protocol that's in use, is very well documented, everybody a lot of people use it. So I want to get that up and running to prove the network works. But then I've had my eye on this other routing protocol that's still being developed. I, I'm not sure if they have a full um, RFC for it yet, but uh, it's called Babel. And it's actually designed for mesh routing, and it takes this into effect. And it can actually weigh all kinds of neat values on there to load balance, not just traffic, but it can actually factor in battery life and stuff like that and distribute it through the network. and redirect like really, really fast, like second by second it has uh, fast convergent on when links have died and how to relink and stuff like that. Once I get this working, that's when I can scale the mesh net to open it up to anybody and they can just add on to the network. Um, you guys have probably seen these things everywhere. They've come to a lot of major cities recently. Um, when they first came to our city, they uh, didn't work with the city and they started impounding them like left and right. So we went to the city and said, could we get some of these? And they're like, sure. So we started taking them apart. <laughs> right, yeah. And um, man, they, they have this awesome battery pack in there. So <laughs> yeah, so um, we've got a bunch of them. And um, yeah, we, we just started playing around with this. And the idea is I want to make a uh, project box and get everything I need in a self-contained waterproof box in one of these batteries and get a solar panel with this. So they would all be way more resilient than, way more uh, robust and harder to, to take down. Um, if you've never played with one of these things, this is like a whole rabbit hole into itself. These things are so cool. The SDR software defined radio. Uh, a lot of people probably know what this is, but if you don't, they're so cool. Look into it. <laughs> but what you can do with these are some really neat things. So um, ADSB, it's um, Automatic Dependent Surveillance Broadcast. This is what every single aircraft broadcast out. It's at 1090 megahertz, and it broadcasts like the heading, the tail number, all, all this kind of stuff. And um, they even make a dongle specifically just for this. But uh, you can use this and just get a simple antenna, and it will give you data like this. And you can make a web server that points from this and, and kind of aggregates all this data. But you can see here it's like the... Uh, the flight number, the altitude, all, all this kind of stuff. And you can actually overlay it into a map, which is really neat because it will actually draw like lines behind the planes and stuff and you can get a real cool visualization of, of what's going on. So what I wanted to do is figure out ways of getting information onto this network without being on the internet but have live updating, updating information. Um, this is the same type of system but it's for ships. It's called AIS. And, um, 
the same kind of thing. You can actually get a crazy amount of data that, that this stuff goes. It's like all about the ship, like the, the length of the ship. You can even sometimes in this tell where the beacon on the ship is placed. It, it, it's got all kinds of neat stuff in there. But you can pull all this down and look at it and, and map it and do all kinds of neat stuff. Um, one of the other things, this is not too exciting, but I think it's important, uh, you could get a network time server on there. And you just get a simple GLONASS GPS dongle, and you can connect directly to the GPS atomic clocks and pull down very, very high accurate time. And that's actually called a Stratum 1 server, where you're directly connected to a, an atomic clock. So uh, we have time, and if anybody needs that or wants that, that's a very important thing. Is that it's not too fun, but it's cool. Um, this is neat. Uh, if anybody's heard of Kiwix, just wiki backwards, what they, what they do is um, the standard, when you download this, like on your phone or to a Raspberry Pi, it will turn your phone into an access point, and you can host all of Wikipedia or whatever other file, I'll get to that in a minute, on there, and it will actually broadcast from that. I did things a little bit differently and didn't make it a, a Wi-Fi access point. I just made it a, a server. But um, you can get these things called zim files, .zim, and it's just a single file that is an entire website compressed into that, that thing. So I have all of Wikipedia on that hard drive you see right there, and it's only 86 gigs. Pictures, text, everything. It's, it looks like you're browsing Wikipedia just like it normally would. But they have tons and tons and tons of other files that you can download, things that are in the public domain and stuff like that. So um, Project Gutenberg, that's the um, books that are in the public domain. So I have every single book ever in the public domain on there. That's only 70 or 67 gigs. Um, I have all of Stack Overflow. It's a, it's a little bit dated, but it's 140 gigs. So again, these are these things that just in case something went down, here's an archived backup of it that anybody could get to. Because I figured without stuff like Stack Overflow, how would you look up any kind of codes or any, anything to troubleshoot stuff. Nobody has that stuff memorized. <laughs> like, um, there's medical encyclopedias on there. There's, um, I have like every TED talk on there because those are free in the public domain. Um, crash course videos, those are uh, PBS, like science-y, history kind of things. So, and this is constantly being added to and growing. So there's always new ZIM files. I want to learn how to actually make your own ZIM file where you can scrape something and throw it on there. But uh, that's, that's that for right there. And then um, I started, uh, I designed a little little pie rack and so I could stack them. And uh, if anybody's interested in this laser cut file, I can share it later. But um, make, make a little, little pie rack. And then each one of these would do a specific function of that SDR thing. One of them would be the plane tracking, one of them would be the time, one of them. And uh, it's not the neatest or the prettiest, but that's, uh, <laughs> that's it right there. And again, it just has to work. It doesn't have to be the best. Like some of these switches are old, but they were free. You know, so hey, that works. Right? Um, you can get in-browser emulators running on this. So this is something my friend actually is hosting on the MeshNet right now, and he's got every kind of like retro game on there, and you just browse to this this address on the MeshNet, and you can pick whatever ROM you want and just start playing it right there in browser. Doesn't matter your device. It's pretty cool. Um, I wish I had some pictures of this, but my friend is making a, um, he got real, real motivated by this, and since it's not on the internet, and people are going to go to normal domains, like Facebook or, or something like that, he wants to make these vandalized, like, prank versions of them, so he wants to make Facebook, where there's, like, dogs on there and stuff, and, like, bitter, which are all these, like, angry things, so... That's, I just wanted to inspire people to do stuff like this and use it in creative ways, kind of, again, like I was saying, with the early 90s internet of just kind of fun, artsy, zany things. Um, so this is where it gets pretty neat. Uh, NOAA, the weather satellites, they broadcast some, some really neat stuff, and uh, you can tune into them. NOAA's 15, 18, 19, they're all analog signal. 20 is digital. There's a um, Russian meteor satellite that you can also tap into. These things slowly break down over time, but they launch new ones, so this is like constantly evolving kind of stuff. But um, this is what it looks like, the analog video feed. It, it, if you get the SDR waterfall, it gives you this kind of neat looking pattern right here. And um, we can actually hear what it sounds like. Yeah. So you, that's actually the sound of the satellite, so you can know when you point it directly at it. But you need a special type of antenna to actually uh, 
decode this. So this is what it transmits right here. There's two channels, left and right, and then they have these bars on the side. And uh, there's a website that will actually help you build these specific antennas to the exact tuning length that you want. So this is uh, 137 megahertz. And uh, it's a double cross antenna because the, uh, we'll learn in a minute, but the, the signal itself is actually two components working together for, uh, this is for, yeah, yeah. And um, yeah, so this is when I was trying to track NOAA 19 for the very first time and we actually got a signal and it wasn't the clearest, but we picked it up and it looked like this. And I know that doesn't look like much, but I consider this a partial success. And part of me wants to tell you that um, you should show your results like this, even if they're not the prettiest. Like, don't just do a custom choice of like the, the coolest looking outcomes. You, you show all the outcomes that you make. And you can see right here, there's those black bars and that there is actually some kind of pattern in here. And I found out later I used the, the wrong resistance wire and stuff like that. So this is how you learn. You, you gotta try and you keep iterating and go faster. But these are some pictures that I didn't pull down, but this is what they, they look like. And you can see um, the bars here and stuff like that. But they come in different infrared spectra that you can pick up. So when you color correct those, you can get stuff like this. And you can look at like different vegetation, and you can look at water temperature, atmospheric um, humidity, stuff like that. It's really neat, but this is still uh, analog. What I want to do is make something a little bit better, get better, um, resistant cable here. I went ahead and got um, grounding rods that were almost the exact length I needed and they're covered in copper. They're not solid copper, but that's okay. And this is the style of antenna I would need to build for that. This is not my antenna here. This is just a picture. But um, I'm going to correct this because that's how we, we get better. But what's really neat is um, NOAA 16 and 17. These are really far away, uh, 22,000 miles out there, and they're actually geostationary orbits. So they stay in one spot in the sky. And these send down high amounts of data, uh, really high resolution. There's 16 different channels. So you can look at all, and that, that's only what's unlocked. They actually have a whole lot more that is not in the public. But like some of these look at the sun, and you can get all the cool sun flares and stuff like that. But what you see here is, um, it's almost like an 8K picture that comes down, and each channel, one comes down every 30 minutes, so it's like constantly shooting out new stuff. And um, these are the coverage that it gets. So you can get from the tip of Australia, uh, uh, Africa, right here, so it's to see the uh, hurricanes that come off right here, and it goes all the way to uh, like New Zealand and Australia. And that, if you can see both at the same time, and where we are, you actually can. I only have a GO-16, which is this one, GO-17 is over here, and they actually just launched a new one that's coming online right now. It's already broadcasting, but they're moving it over, GO-18, and uh, it's really cool. But um, sometimes it's easier not to reinvent the wheel, and there's actually a kit on Amazon you can get. I know that's not very hackery, but uh, if you want to start pulling down signals, you can right now. And what's neat is they actually have a specific filter just for the GO satellites that will block everything out and amplify just a narrow bandwidth. And then this is just a SDR dongle specifically for this. And um, when I first got my antenna, I was so excited I slept next to it that night because I couldn't wait to like wake up the next morning and put it together and start doing stuff. So it was like Christmas morning for me, you know. <laughs> and, uh, there, there I am with it and I was really excited. And um, use the same kind of antenna base that I'd been using before to, to make this. And I just put it outside of our makerspace on the ground and I left it out there to weather test it and just see everything that was going on before I put it up on the roof. And it was out here for a few months and everything worked great. Got a little project box like this and everything's, the pies in there and everything. Everything was great, everything's been waterproofed and this is the um, filter. The filter has to be very close to the actual receiver so you don't have the, the loss of the line. But um, you'll start getting packets from space, Ooh, like this. And um, it makes some really, really cool pictures. So here's one of them that I pulled down. This is actually my birthday last year but I've been tracking this all year and you can actually put them together and make some really cool gifts. I wanted to make one, but it crashed the program trying to load it in here because they are like hundreds of megabytes per GIF. <laughs> it, it, it's crazy. So um, I just went to the NOAA website itself and just kind of, oh, it's not going to work. Yeah. Um, 
I'll just tell you what it is because it was really cool. It's a picture of the Earth at the same time of day, every single day for a whole year. So you see the equinox and the solstice and the light shift back and forth. And it, 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 it's really cool. I wish I could show you. Use your imagination. <laughs> um, let's keep going. Who knows who uh, Cloud Shannon is? This, this guy is awesome. Yeah, right, right. He's one of my heroes. Well, as a, he's the father of information theory. He's the one who first used the word bit. He didn't create the word bit, but first to use it in a paper. And um, he was the one who first converted the uh, phones to digital and figured out you could make essentially all information, a uh, Boolean kind of output. But what was cool about this guy is... Um, he, he did all kinds of like silly things. If you've seen the, the do nothing machine, it's like a little switch and like you switch it and a little hand comes off and turns itself off. That's all it does. He would make stuff like that just kind of as a joke, but it was like intellectually curious and neat. But he, he juggled and he rode unicycles and he did all these really crazy things. And as I was building these different antennas and learning about digital information and learning about him, I got more into the same stuff without knowing that he did these things too and started doing a lot of flow art stuff. And um, I'll get to that in a minute. But um, the digital signal that I, I wanted to learn how, how did this NOAA satellite get the, the signals back in such high bandwidth and stuff like that. And it's something called QPSK, uh, Quadrature Phase Shift Key. And what it means is you have um, a sine and cosine wave. They're, they're 90 degrees out of phase. And it was neat. I was learning all about this. And it actually uses like the um, complex plane, which is like the imaginary number set and stuff. I had to learn all about that, teach myself this. I didn't know any of this stuff. And it was blowing my mind. It was really cool. But what you can essentially do is the, I guess you would say the horizontal and the vertical components are independent. And you can modulate each one of them in the same signal without interfering with them. So you can make this sort of circular diagram. And with that, you have these four points up in here. And there's going to be noise in any signal, so you can approximate what corner it was trying to go for. But you can get two bits out of each single dot with that, with that phase shift. And you can see it a little bit better here. This green line, that's the um, what they call the in-phase and the quadrature components. And together, it creates this wave. And that wave is the actual data containing wave. That's what you would actually want to record if you wanted to, to redo something. But you can see here, by, by adjusting the red and the blue lines, you can get into any of those four corners that you, you need. And that's how the signal is actually transferred. So um, there's Cloud Shannon. And uh, this is the kind of stuff you'll do. You just like juggle on unicycles and stuff like that. And the, the funny thing was, when I was building my antennas and I'd need like a few breaks and walk around, I'd set my antenna down and there was a unicycle right next to it and I didn't know any of this stuff. So it was really kind of neat how it kind of converged onto that. But what I would do to, to kind of clear my mind was uh, we got into flow arts and, and spinning fire. This is outside of our making, maker space. And um, oh, the, the videos aren't going to load. <laughs> but um, we would do different things where we'd do like, essentially like tightrope walking while we're doing these different things. And the point that I'm bringing this up for, which I think Shannon probably did, here's some of the pictures that I'm, I'm going to use. Um, when I was learning this stuff, they would teach you to, to stay in four quadrants of your body, like to do stuff up here, up here, down there. And that's right when I was learning about the, uh, the four phases. So what's neat is you have um, LED and fire people doing this stuff. But over here is the IQ... Uh, signal and it was very weird that all these things kind of lined up at the same time that so one of the things we want to do is um, figure out how we could actually spin and create digital signals and have a camera watches and have maybe like a metronome or something to do like our timestamp or like click out loud like once per second and you could spell out things or, or do some kind of signal we we, we want to do that and make some sort of software that interprets the visual stuff and uh, see if we can make it say like hello world or something <laughs> as we're spinning. But um, the reason I bring this up is um, if anybody knows what your cerebellum is, it's back here. It's That's where like two thirds of your neurons are. And the, the reason I'm saying this is a lot of your brain, that's like your motor memory kind of stuff. It's a non-conscious part. So a lot of what you think you are and a lot of your conscious self is not what your whole brain is. 
So I think by getting into these different modes and, and doing things like that, you actually start thinking in different ways and using different parts of your brain. It actually helped me problem solve in ways. If, if you're uh, kind of like ADD or ADHD like I am, that really helped me focus a lot. And um, if you don't want to do flow arts, one thing you can try to do is like brush your teeth with the other hand. It really makes you concentrate and, and be in the moment. And I, I suggest you try that. It, it, it's really cool. But um, from here on, I'm going to talk about um, radio stuff. If anybody has their ham radio, it's, it's really cool. But this is all the stuff from here on forward you have to have a license to do. But um, I just got my license in February. And I'm KO4 WCS. Yeah! I encourage all y'all to get yours, too. It, it, it's really easy and really fun. Thank you for that. Yeah. Um, APRS. This is a really neat system. It's an um, automated packet reporting system. It was actually made in the 80s, and it uses the AX25 packet. It's a digital packet. And... Um, it, it goes up to layer two, but it has some like routing into it. And what's really neat is there actually has like a TTL, time to live kind of thing built in. So as you send out a transmission, you can at the end of it do like three dash three, and it will hop three times then through these digipeters. And eventually you want to hit something called an I gate, and it will inject it into the internet itself. Um, these are standards, so like all of North America has one frequency, 144.39, but these are, are all over the world. And what's really neat about this is you can get 16 different beacons with your, um, what they call an SSID, but it's not the same as a Wi-Fi SSID. It's essentially your uh, ham radio call sign. And you don't have to actually be there. So you can make like weather balloons or, or weather stations or something like that, that that report back different data. And what's neat about it, and they look kind of like that, like traditionally, the, the weather balloon buoy kind of things. But you can, you can make your own with, with things like this. So um, one of these things that I just got recently, it's, um, these things are called terminal node controllers. It's essentially just a radio modem. It's nothing too fancy. But they used to be really complex in the 80s. And you don't even really need this. You could just get a sound card to, to do all the work and emulate it in software. But what this thing does is I actually have one right here. Um, it could connects over Bluetooth, so I can connect with my phone to the, the device, and then the, the device just goes over analog audio into the radio. And I can do something from my phone, I can like send out a message. So what's neat is you can actually do like text messaging from radio to radio with these things, you send your GPS coordinates, stuff like that, and you can be in the middle of nowhere, you can be like hiking in the woods, out in the ocean, literally wherever, and these, these things would communicate together. Um, this is just a better picture of what I have right here, and uh, it just straps to the back. A lot of people probably have these Baofeng radios. They're like 20, 30 bucks. They're really cool. If you don't have one, I suggest get one before the price goes crazy high. But um, you can get something called APRS Droid on your phone, and you actually don't even need that. Like I was saying, you could just plug directly in if you still have a headphone jack on your phone and plug in. This is just nice because it's wireless, so I could have this like in a backpack or something like that. But um, you can overlay all this data onto a map, and it's in real time. So you can have like tracking things, and you can see where people are, and then you can click on them and send them like a text message, and they can reply back to you and stuff. But this is what's really neat is um, there is one thing that you can, if you, if you compose the message just right and you get all the syntax in there, you send a message to SMS GTE, SMS gate, and add the phone number to it. This will text an actual cell phone. So it goes from radio to RF, out hops as many times through the digipeter, eventually gets injected into the, the eye gate through the internet to the internet. It will go through the internet and then be rebroadcasted through the, the cellular service and be sent to the cell phone. The cool part is the cell phone can then reply to that message and it will go all the way back through and you will get it back out on your radio. You can do this anywhere in the world. And it's free. You just have to actually have good coverage to do this. And that's the problem with the APRS system is it's not really well built out. I mean, it kind of is, but it, it needs better better coverage. So um, I'm building a, a DigiPeter for the mesh net right here. And um, I don't have a power supply for it yet, but I got the rack mount right there. And um, this is cool. This is actually a little side note. This is from uh, WNYC Radio. They gave us their old rack. From, they were cleaning out their old equipment. And somehow ended up in Norfolk, and we got it. <laughs> but um, here you go. This is the um, antenna that I bought, and I actually got high gain um, 
cable for this. this the, the cable was more than the damn antenna. But um, here is um, the radio modem, essentially. It's uh, a TNC, and there's a, a, a little group, a radio, amateur radio group, that makes and sells these. And they plug into Raspberry Pis. They only go 9,600 baud. Not very fast, but it's faster than zero. And if you're just doing text documents or, or just texting, th this is really cool. And you can SSH into the mesh net. I wanted to actually get that up and running to show you guys, but didn't have enough time to do that. But I could SSH without a direct line of sight just from this thing into my network and then like work on the servers or something. So I think that's pretty cool. Um, one caveat of, of all this that I, I must tell everybody that, you know, the hacker group, for some reason, um, Amateur radio, you cannot encrypt anything, which sucks. <laughs> but there's one, one rule that's exception to that. If you are sending command and control kind of things, you are allowed to encrypt. Don't take this from me, but I would say SSHing into something is command and control. I don't think that's really bending the rules, so uh, I think it's fine to use that for encryption because that you wouldn't want to just like connect unsecurely to that. But um, the software you can run on this is called Exaster, and it's free for, it's open source for any platform, but you can install these on the Raspberry Pis, and then these would generate the packets. The packets would go into the TNC modem and then off through the RF or backwards and receive it in. They can digipeat this to where they kind of like store and forward it. It's really just like a millisecond delay and it rebroadcasts, or you can inject it into the internet. Um, I want to figure out how to inject this into the mesh net and not go into the internet and have it be able to pick up and map stuff and be able to, to repeat and kind of hop multiple multiple pathways like that. Um, has anybody heard of Net44, Ampernet? I'd never heard of this. Okay, some people. I, I ask a lot of routing or network people. They've heard of it, but nobody really knew anything about it. And I, when I found this, it, it, it like, wow. So there's a slash eight network space, um, what that means is uh, 44 dot, and then anything in those next three octets, that's a part of the entire thing. So it's like 17 million, I think, addresses? I could be wrong about Yeah, I think it's about 17 million addresses. Um, this was set aside when radio was first created. Like, I don't take me for this exactly. I think it was in like the 70s or the 80s or something like that. They, they, they reserved this address space just for this. And um, it's largely unknown and unused, and uh, they just recently sold off a quarter of it to Amazon because so much of it wasn't used, but they still literally have millions of addresses left. And what's good about this, though, is um, they are now using that money to self-sustain this entire project. So it has like money indefinitely now to keep this working. But if you have a, a ham radio call sign, you can go to this website and request IPv4 address blocks. It, it, it's really cool because those have been exhausted and they're hard to get. You can go get like 10,000 of them or something if you want. The only thing is you have to use this for radio. And then the other thing is um, it's kind of like the OG darknet. They, um, your home routing and a lot of home ISPs, they will not route to the 44 network. But um, oh, I meant to say Ampernet stands for um, Amateur Packet Radio Network. So it, it, it's literally exactly what I wanted was packet radio with IP addresses. So I'm going to try to figure out how to use this to use it on our mesh net to, to name all the nodes and give them, give them IP addresses and stuff. Um, I need to look more into detail about legal, not legally, but technically what you're supposed to use them for and not use them for. Like you can't make an ISP with this, even though I'd want to and stuff like that. Um, another thing, um, I'm showing these as examples for the mesh net itself. There's uh, the internet linking, radio linking project. What's neat about this is they're trying to connect all these repeaters and all these different radios literally around the entire world through the internet. So if I just had a, a, a phone or any kind of internet connected thing, I could use my voice on that. It would go through the internet. Actually, I have a little thing. And there's something like a, um, like a zip code, essentially, that you can dial in to that part of the world and see where these towers are. So I could look up like one in Europe somewhere, like specifically Germany or something like that, type that in, and it would retransmit over RF in Germany so I could talk to my friend through the internet over there and he could reply back through this. So I think these things are neat examples of 
stuff like peripheral internet where you're connecting networks together and it's uh, kind of like a non-traditional use of the internet. Um, Echo Link does the same kind of thing where you can um, connect different things all around the world. And they eventually want to get it to where you could just use one of these things and call anywhere on the planet with it. So that, that's pretty ambitious, but I, I think it's awesome. Um, Winlink is really, really cool. This is a global radio internet or email. And um, it looks kind of like just a basic mail client inbox kind of thing like Outlook or whatever. You can either use this, like I was just saying, through the internet, but this is completely independent. You can use these, these don't have a dedicated frequency either. You can use them on like HF, send them all around the world. So this is kind of like your post-apocalyptic internet um, email service right here. But it, 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 it's really neat because um, it, it you, you, yeah, you can send all kinds of cool stuff. There's a, a guy that does this. Um, this is his call sign right here, but he lives way up in the, the northern latitudes, and he'll go camping with, like, fold-out solar panels and stuff, and people said, like, you couldn't do this, and he's just proving them wrong, showing that you can send all this stuff, and he'll make all these cool connections all around Europe from, like, way up here, and he barely gets any sunlight and stuff like that, and somehow he's still able to do all this stuff. So if part of the Internet were to go down you could actually send this to a, a part of the world where the internet is working and inject it over there, or just everything is down. You could communicate independently with this. Um, this was a good moment for me because I've been building this network for like in my hobby time for a few years now, just on and off because, you know, we got jobs and lives and stuff and it's expensive and hard. And I found this, it's the Amateur Radio Emergency Data Network, data specifically, and when I looked at this, I was like, hold on, wait a minute, that looks like the, the Nano Station M5 that I've been using, and it exactly is. So there's already a pre-established protocol and standard amongst hams to make something essentially like the mesh net I've been trying to make with the same hardware, with the same sort of goals in mind of creating um, an emergency data network in case things go down, you could still have communications and you could drop pins in places and be like, oh, there's hazards here, let's meet here, y you know, that kind of thing. Um, yeah, that's some of their, um, their, their stuff there. But they already have protocols made, so you have like VoIP phones and all these things in there, and you can just set this stuff up. And they actually have a, um, a uh, USB drive that has everything on it, all the routing and everything, and you can plug it right in, and it just works. So I kind of want to use this as a like a overlap with my existing network. And this might actually make me look a lot more creditable when I go to different tall towers and say, hey, can I get on your roof and put this like anarchist net thing up there? But it's like, no, no, this is actually a, an established Arden net that, that hams use. And it looks a lot more professional. And I think that would help open up doors to, to letting me do this. And it's not just me alone doing this now. There's hams not just in my local town, but all over the world that would have this so, sort of protocol. So I kind of want to overlap the two, like a Venn diagram where there's a lot of, lot of same things on here. Um, yeah, that's a good amount of time. So this is the end right here. Um, I'm Jameson Dungan. If you want a copy of the slide, email me right there. Or if you need the, um, any plans or anything I've done, I, I'll help send it to you. Um, go ahead and look up um, 757 Makerspace. That's where I hang out. Like I said, if you're ever in that area, it's super cool. Look up NFK MeshNet and um, be excellent to one another and hack the planet. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Jameson. We have uh, 10 minutes or so for Q&A. If anyone has any questions, go ahead excellent. and ask. Yeah, we've got one right here. First, you got an answer, then a question. Sure. Whoa, yeah. cool. The other thing that's one of the many other things you're going to be talking about is delay and disruption power networking, DTN, you know, going forward. Oh, right, forward, right. Kind of like email, but not necessarily. Wondering whether you've looked at putting a DTN capability into this so when they maybe down for hours at a stretch and then come back up, you can still move things forward. Yeah, 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 absolutely, yeah, yeah. That's, that's the other thing I meant to, to mention is a lot of this stuff, I don't know what I'm doing, and I've been teaching myself this over over the years and stuff, so I need to learn more about routing and stuff like that. So if anybody has any suggestions of helping me with this, I'm more than open to this because, like I said, I don't know what I'm doing. One of the things I meant to say earlier, too, with the um, 
the flow arts and juggling and stuff like this. I think this crosses a lot over into our hacker community. Uh, I dated a girl once that was big into the circus stuff, and she told me that jugglers were the most hard-headed out of any of the, the people because you have to start off failing. You start off just by, like, dropping things on the ground, and it's, it's just uphill the whole time. So you have to really have this, like, try and fail keep trying kind of kind of attitude and not get too caught up with that or not have too much of your ego attached to the failing and know that failing is just part of the process to learn and get going further with that. So um, I would encourage everybody to, to go out and learn, not be afraid to, to just try stuff and do stuff and that's how you, you go forward. Yeah. Hmm. I don't know, man. I kind of already don't follow the rules or laws, but uh, yeah, I don't know. I'll get back to that. <laughs> I guess a follow up to that is like, what's your negotiation conversation like when you have to pitch something to someone new? Like, what's a good strategy for that? Because I think obviously you need that in your company, but that that's like the door right there. Yeah, you're right. That actually is one of the harder things because um, talking to somebody that manages these buildings or owns these buildings. They're not like in my peer group, <laughs> you know, these, they own like properties and stuff. So I've been going to people that I do know that I can just kind of talk to and be like, hey, can we do this? And my, one of my friends is a professional installer of things, so he can actually drill through the walls and make really good like cable runs and stuff like that. So what we're trying to do is get an example up and running to where it's actually working and then we can go and approach these other people and have an example and say, look, this is how it works, this is what's going for. And we're, we, we're talking to some of the local city government because they know about this stuff and they want to try to digitize the city and make it like a modern city to where they have, um, our city floods a lot and they want to make like little sensors to if the, the streets flood so you could get like a text message to move your car real fast or something like that. They don't know how to do that. They tried with like LoRaWAN but it's still not quite working. So I want to make it look more professional and then like I said with the art in net that might make it look a little more professional. So then I could approach them. Um, one of the, the things that I'm trying to do right now is the Opera House uh, downtown. Uh, a lot of people work in there that I know, and they have kind of are open to the idea of me doing that, and I feel like there's going to be a tipping point where if a lot of people have it and a lot of like, like professional people, I don't know what the word is, have it, um, it will look more authentic, and then I could go to other people and be like, look, it's not just like me and my friends like putting up strings and tin cans or something like this is a, a real thing that's utilized by the city and if it actually has like real function and utility that other people can use they'll probably listen more but I'm still trying to figure that out like I said it's learn as you go kind of thing but um yeah or yeah, whoever <laughs> Right. And I'd be curious, uh, like I think actually Indonesia is about to do it in a couple of days. Um, who's going to do it? Sorry? Who, who, who's? Indonesia. It's oh. It's like a soft shutdown. Uh, the details are relevant. Yeah, right, right. Um, I'm curious, out of your vast experience of like alternative networking for PPP, what would be like the most, like what's the best like deployable failover? You know, hmm. like. Right, right. So that's actually what I want to try to do is once this is all figured out and I get all the, the kinks ironed out, I want to make like an actual image and host that on there and then just say, hey, download this image, stick it on a pie, put an antenna up, point it towards the network, and it will just do its thing and connect. And once that's like that, I want to, to just open this. So then, like you're saying, it could be a village in the middle of nowhere, like out of Burning Man or something. They could just make their own networks that are not connected. And so I'm still trying to build this out as it goes to figure out what we could actually use stuff like that for. And that's why I was giving the examples of like being able to back up Wikipedia and host things on there for people. But when I first started this, that was kind of like a, a paranoid thought. People thought I was kind of crazy. Like, and then over the years, like you said, um, like AWS will go down. This is not a replacement for Amazon Web Services. but. Uh, that, that's been going down more, or like you said, like political disruption, or just the, the state of the world right now. It wasn't like that a few years ago. So this 
actually has become more validating as I've been working on it that it, it wasn't such a farce because I just felt like this dude on rooftops connecting things to nothing. <laughs> like it felt really weird, you know what I mean? And you just have to kind of keep going forward and, and trust in yourself that you're doing something and you believe in it. And even if it doesn't go to that, it's just like a fun local network that we can have. And as long as you're just having fun with your friends, I think that's a, one of the important things to not lose track of. But by having fun, you learn stuff and you build stuff that actually becomes useful to other people. And then I'm just a single person. I'm trying to create this so other people who are way smarter than me or have very specific, uh, specific task uh, skills can add on to this and engineer to this. So I feel like once you get those first three layers down, that's like building roads, and then everybody can drive on the roads and, and do stuff and make stuff, set up shops and things. So I want to see where this goes by just like creating a blank canvas and letting people paint on it and stuff like that. But I I'm, I'm want to figure out like more utilities to scale it and stuff like that. All right, we've got time for one more question. All right, last question. So Yeah, yeah, that's what we've been actually looking at of like, is there a distributed DNS? We're like, no, not really. And then it gets back to like a central authority, like you're saying. And so, yes, as decentralized as it is, you do have to have like a, a, an authority of it. So what I'm thinking is creating a website on the MeshNet and you could go on there and register your domain like you would on the real internet and just have like an authority there. And then that would be your, your thing. It's one of those things that it's like, when we get to that bridge, that's when I want to cross it kind of thing. But it, that is an issue that I've been trying to figure out. And like I said, as I go through this, I try to meet up with people that have very specific things to help show me what I should do to make this better. And I just want to get more people interested and involved in it. And once they do, they'll start being able to help me with this. But if anybody has any ideas or wants to talk about this more, please come up to me. I need to learn. I want to learn. <laughs> There's so much more to learn. Yeah. And but also, register it. any questions you have on the chat thread for this talk room, because that will persist over time. So you'll be able to interact over the course of the, the rest of the conference and beyond. And any information documentation that you have, Jameson, that you can put on there, it'll be available to everybody who is involved in the conference. Excellent. Thank, Thank you so you. much for the talk. It oh, oh one last thing. Um, come back in one hour. My friend Xavier back here, he's giving a talk on bioprinting. He's a good friend of mine. There he is in the back corner. We come from the same city. We started a, a genetic, a synthetic biology lab together, all this other cool stuff. But, yeah, tune into his talk in an hour. Thank you all for coming out and listening. Hack the planet.